thank you for coming out. I, I was wondering how many people, when you were back in elementary school, were taught anything about King Philip's Indian War? <laughs> yeah, one person. Uh, I lived in Longmeadow, Mass, and my town was attacked, yet they never taught it to us, and it would have been a, a perfect subject. So I became interested because I would see signs for King Philip Cave, Medicom Ave, all these signs to do with King Philip's War, and I began to investigate and ended up doing two books on it. One, The first one was Until I Have No Country, and that's a historical novel. So the lead character is a Native American who, who's fictional, but all the events that happened to him really did happen. So it's a way to go through the war as if you're with these natives. And then I got very lucky and met an author named Eric Schultz, and he was working on a book on the history of King Philip's War. And so Eric did the majority of the book. I came on a little bit later, and that book is simply titled King Philip's War. And um, I have a new book out. It is called Above and Beyond, and it's about a lesser known event during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The, most of us think, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis ended without any loss of life, and Kennedy was able to get the missiles removed. But we lost one of our Air Force majors to Soviet surface-to-air missiles over Cuba. His name was Major Rudy Anderson, and he was shot down and killed. And so I always wondered, why didn't anybody tell the story of this one <coughs> serviceman who gave his life? And uh, that's what Above and Beyond is about. And during our research, we realized at the very moment he was being shot down, another one of our U-2 spy planes that was over the Arctic Circle collecting radioactive samples became disoriented by the northern lights. He goes into Russian airspace 300 miles over Russia. The Soviets think we're launching World War III. They send up their MiGs. We send up our fighter jets, and we came about this close to nuclear war. So uh, this book, it, there's a lot of uh, moments in it that makes your hair stand up. Uh, you'll see there's a couple other lesser known incidents that have only been recently uh, revealed by the CIA documents that are declassified. And I got lucky I was able to find one of the U-2 pilots who flew over Cuba and work with him on the book. So before I get started, if anybody's interested, I do a newsletter once a year. So you can print your email, and you can just circulate this while I'm giving the King Philip's War talk. And pretend you're watching a movie with me narrating. So I'm going to take you to some of the sites to do with King Philip's War. And in the uh, history book that I did with Eric, we include a lot of maps so people can go, go to these sites. So this is the the lay of the land before the Europeans came, where the different tribes were located. And uh, King Philip was a Wampanoag, so, or Wampanoag, it's pronounced either way. And does anybody remember his Indian given name? Medicom. Yeah, Medicom or Medicomet. And um, so he went by both names. Philip was his English given name when relationships were good. And believe it or not, his father was Massasoit. So what a strange irony that Massasoit helped the pilgrims. He had an ulterior motive. And that was Massasoit being the leader of the Wampanoags wanted an ally against the more mighty Narragansetts. So that's why he let the pilgrims get established because he formed this alliance with them. But uh, it turned out to be a huge mistake from the native standpoint, and it's his son who's trying to drive them out of their, their land. So a little bit of the background. A lot of us think that the Native Americans in New England were like those out west, you know, nomadic, always on the move, but they had their summering grounds and wintering grounds, so permanent villages and um, would live in the Weetus, we call them wigwams. 
These are really effective to keep the heat in during the winter time because you could have um, just a little fire in the middle, a blanket covering the door, smoke hole at the top, and between body heat and the fire, uh, that would keep the wigwam warm. They were agricultural based people. They would pound the, the corn there and the mortar and pestle. Mm -hmm. And some of the highest concentrations of Native Americans anywhere in America were right here in coastal Massachusetts, in coastal Rhode Island. This was a big axe head we found down in uh, Plymouth. And they'd use an axe like that to cut down a big white pine tree. And the white pines would be turned into dugout canoes. That was the tree of choice. If you, you hear the term birch bark canoe, you're usually talking about natives from northern New England where you have the big white birches. Here in southern New England, they use the dugout canoes. And that was my mentor with the Native Americans. His name is uh, Stanley. And Stanley's passed away, but he would teach me. He's the one who helped me find that big axe head. But Stanley taught me how to work the atl, -atl. That's really one of the first inventions of mankind. Um, the spear will rest on the throwing stick, and when he whips his arm forward, he doesn't let go of the throwing stick, but the spear gets propelled off it. Uh, incredible little trick. I, I've taken that to football fields and stood at one goalpost and could almost hit the other goalpost. It's that accurate. Stanley, I remember he liked to joke, he said, this is man's first step to the moon. <laughs> you know? Because when you think about it, something beyond just throwing a rock, using that extra propulsion. And then, of course, by the time of King Philip's Indian War, the natives had bow and arrow, and they had muskets. They'd been trading for muskets. And that's why I put this slide in of a different friend. His name is Wes. He's an Abenaki Indian. Uh, but I put the slide in to show that the natives during King Philip's War did have muskets. Their problem was they could repair a broken musket. They could even manufacture sometimes the, the balls, but they couldn't manufacture gunpowder. So if they became low on gunpowder, that, that was an issue. And the natives would hunt deer, and they would utilize every part of the animal's body uh, even the antlers, they're so hard that you could take a piece of quartz in one hand and just chipping it with the antler, flake it into a projectile point. So that's how Stanley taught me to make arrowheads, using a deer antler, some rawhide on your hand to keep it from getting cut, and just holding a piece of obsidian or quartz, something that flakes well. There's a, a book you may want to look up. The library might have it. It was written in the 1630s by William Wood, and it's called New England Prospect. And in it, he says, there's this great beast in the new world, and we call it the moose. And then his next sentence says, we plan to ride it, and it will plow all our fields. <laughs> but, you know, you, you think about it. He must have thought, hey, it looks like a horse. Why couldn't we domesticate it? But that never quite happened. But moose was the, the name the natives used, and it means twig eater, because they would eat the new growth of trees. Muskrat lodges, natives would raid them. This one's been raided by an otter, but natives would raid them, uh, not to get the muskrat, but to get the roots and the tubers that the muskrat had stored inside the lodge. And then they were smart enough to repatch the top so that the muskrat could survive the winter, leave a few roots in there for it. We would call that conservation. They called it survival. Um, but that was just one of their many, many tricks of living off the land. This, um, now we switch to the colonists, where they would alter the landscape to suit their needs. So for example, this is Long Ditch in Dedham. And it connects one part of the Charles River with another. Uh, so it actually is like a little shortcut on the Charles River. Um, when they do the races on the Charles, they have to post a guard here, because if you know where it is, you could bypass six miles of the river. But uh, the colonists dug this by hand to drain these lowlands so that their cattle could feed on the marsh grass. So from a 
colonial perspective, the cattle was the prized possession. And that caused all sorts of trouble with the Native Americans because if the cattle got free and were roaming around, they would eat the Indian corn and you just had conflict after conflict because of the, the cattle. Another thing the colonists would do would be to build mill ponds. This one here, this would make a nice day trip if you're ever interested. This is the Gilbert Stewart Mill down in Whitford, Rhode Island. Beautiful old mill. And basically the way it works is, you know, they dam up the stream to create this little pond. And when they need the power to go through the mill, they'd open up a sluice way and the water would funnel through, hit the mill wheel, the wheel would turn and that would provide the, the power. We're out at P-Town Cape Cod and the reason I put this in is to remind people that when the pilgrims first came, they didn't go directly to Plymouth. They actually went to Cape Cod and were thinking of settling there. But they um, discovered an abandoned, very small Indian site, probably a former village, and found a tub of corn buried there in a woven basket and took it back to the Mayflower. Bradford wrote in his journal, we plan to compensate the Indians for the corn we took. But the Indians didn't know that, so they realized their corn had been stolen and they attacked the pilgrims, which is why they got back on the Mayflower very late in the season and went on to Plymouth. And that caused them, you know, no end of hardship because very late in the year, they're going from their uh, Mayflower into their little shallop, and then they'd have to wade the last, say, you know, 10 feet in the ocean. So you're getting wet from the waist down. And many of the pilgrims uh, came down with pneumonia that winter and did not make it. As the, the settlements expanded, they always had town commons, and the really good ones, this is Grafton Town Common, it's a beauty. That's my daughter, she's now 30, living in Hong Kong. <laughs> but uh, she would come with me on all my research, so she loves history now, so I guess it rubbed off. But uh, the really good town common still had the old fence around it because the purpose is to bring your sheep and cattle in at night because it's common land, so anybody could use it. So if we're all residents of Norfolk, we could put our livestock on the town green at night and um, it would be protected by the fence. Because we had wolves in Massachusetts, we had mountain lion back then. One thing that the natives were proficient at was catching beaver. Here's a beaver dam. And uh, they would uh, trade the pelts for iron in implements, muskets, pots, you name it. One of the places they would bring them was the Aptuxet trading post. This, if you ever get down to the Cape Cod Canal, this is over on the Bourne side of the canal. And back then there was no canal, just these two rivers. Today the canal goes like that, has obliterated the rivers. But this recreation of the trading post is still there and you could take a nice walk around it. And I don't know if these stocks are still there, but these were like the largest stocks I've ever seen. And you'd be put in these for a number of infractions. Um, if you swore, blasphemy, um, stealing, uh, and it must have been awful to be in the, for the whole day, you know, your hands like this and your head stooped over. And one thing that, again, they never really taught us in school is that the Puritans who settled Boston and Westward uh, were, you know, some of the most intolerant people on the planet. If you had a different religious viewpoint, they'd put you in the stocks and they would kick uh, Quakers out if they still profess their different religion. And that's why there's no Quaker meeting houses west of Boston. They're all down in Rhode Island or Dartmouth and close to Rhode Island uh, because Roger Williams had a more open society. So this, this is a Quaker meeting house down in Dartmouth, Mass. So they left this area uh, west of Boston and moved further south. We were just talking about the praying Indians on the uh, Charles River. 
Um, so this is in South Natick. So this experiment with the praying Indians um, was actually going very well. Reverend John Elliott was converting them to Christianity. They were living in you know small homes like the white man would, uh, farming, and it was a huge community. It was both all on the Natick side and on the Dover Sherborne side of the river. But then when King Philip's War broke out, these natives just, they wanted to stay neutral, uh, just stay out of it. But they were suspected of maybe helping Medicom, so they were all put out on Deer Island um, so that they couldn't get involved in the war. And the problem was the Puritans didn't give them enough food or blankets to survive the winter. So many of these same praying Indians did not survive the first winter on Deer Island. So what did Medicom look like? Well, our publisher originally put this on the cover of our book, and I said, he didn't look like that. And they said, have you got a better painting? <laughs> and the problem was nobody bothered to do a sketch of him while he was alive. We have eyewitness reports of what he looked like. Uh, the natives were taller than the colonists, uh, perfect teeth, and um, he certainly wouldn't have had a little gold crown on his head. And then we saw this picture, and I said, that looks more like a Roman gladiator. He didn't look like that either. So it wasn't until I found Phil Cote, a sculpture, who did a version that I said, that's more like it. And I always thought it was amazing that out of a piece of bronze, he could get a look in the eye. You know, how do you do that out of bronze? And I said, why did you give him that faraway look? And he said, I wanted to portray him in the closing days of the war, and I knew what he meant because the war lasted 14 months and towards the end, in month 13 and 14, Medicom's wife and young son were taken captive by the English and usually a woman or a child would be sold into slavery and end up in either uh, Bermuda or one of the Caribbean islands to work the sugarcane fields. So the that's kind of the background to give you a little bit about the difference between the colonist way of life and how the Native Americans were living. And then the next group of slides will take us through the war. So the war starts in June of 1675. So that's quite a period of relative peace here in Massachusetts because of Massasoit. Um, but there are a couple events close to 1675, where you could see maybe it was going to head towards, towards war. And uh, if you were a native, it must have been really a tough decision. What do you do? You know, if you do nothing, you can see where the status quo is going to lead to. You're losing more and more land. You're losing more and more people, uh, primarily from disease that you as a native did not have immunities to. The English could survive measles, a native probably couldn't. So, you know, it, was a, it must have been an awful decision. Do you take up arms or do you just try to uh, get along as best you can? And one of the triggers was the death of John Sassamon. And there's two versions, the native version and the, the English version. The English version says that Sassamon was an interpreter. He was a Native American, but he could speak both English and the Indian tongue. And his body was found under the ice at Assawampsit Pond down in uh, Middleborough and Lakeville when the ice melted. So he had disappeared, then his body was found, the English assumed, and that's who did this sketch, an English person, assumed that it was Medicom's people that had him killed assuming that maybe he was telling them a little more information than just an interpreter. Uh, the native version says we had nothing to do with his death. He might have fallen under the ice on his own. We don't know. But we'll never know for sure. But what happened was the English rounded up three of Medicom's closest aides, brought them to uh, Plymouth for a trial, found them guilty, and hung all three. And so if you're Medicom you know, you, you now know the English are really calling the shots. It's their laws that are governing the land, not yours anymore. And I, th I think that was one of the straws that broke the camel's back of why 
he decided to start this uprising. The other was uh, his brother died under mysterious circumstances after the English interrogated him. Uh, again, we'll never know what happened. Did the English poison him, or did he just die from the stress of the interrogation? But he died just uh, within a 24-hour period after they released him. So the headquarters of both Massasoit and Medicom is uh, the Mount Hope Peninsula in Bristol, Rhode Island. Again, another nice place to make a day trip to. You can walk down to Mount Hope. Brown University owns this land. And um, this is where my novel opens up. So this is the start of the novel. Tamaset, who's that fictional character, is coming back to, to Mount Hope to meet with Medicom. And legend has it that this is where they would hold their meetings. Uh, it's this big cliff and then a flat area in the front. You can see I'm sitting there. And um, Wampanoags today, particularly those from, it's a sub subsect, I guess they call them subtribes. Uh, I'm not Native American, by the way. Everybody thinks I must have a little blood. I don't have a drop. And if I could choose, I'd be a uh, Pequot because they own Foxwoods. <laughs> but uh, he, um, Medicom would uh, be here, and today the Poconokets still do their celebrations at this King Philip's chair, they call it. So they let me come, the only non-native, and I said, can I take pictures? And they said, yes. And um, it was fascinating how they did their uh, spring ceremony. They had one of the youngsters shoot an arrow off into the woods. All the other kids would run and try and find it. Whoever found it first became the honorary leader for the next year's spring celebration. But if you found the arrow, it was such an honor, you got extra homework about the tribe. <laughs> and because they're worried about, you know, tribal customs disappearing over time. And some of the, the words, um, I know like four or five Wampanoag words, but the children, they want them to remember most of the language. So the war starts when some warriors or Wampanoags, I guess you wouldn't call them warriors yet because the war hasn't started, but this is what triggers it, decide they've had enough of the English cattle in the town of Swansea straying and eating their crops. So they go into Swansea and they kill eight of the cattle. And the farmer is there with a young man and they see what's happening. And it's the young man who picks up the musket, kills a native, and boom, the war has started. The natives retaliate. They kill people in Swansea. Uh, then they come back to uh, Mount Hope, where that King Philip's chair is. And they tell Medicom, so he didn't plan this raid. It just happened before he was ready. Uh, he was hoping to get other tribes to align with him, but this happened prematurely. But he's smart enough to know, hey, I can't stay on Mount Hope because if I do, they're going to come and trap me. It's a peninsula. So he takes his people through the Pocasset Swamp, across uh, the Mount Hope Bay and the Taunton River, and um, hides over on the, the Tiverton side, uh, Little Compton side. And this, this field is known as the Pease Field, and it's the first skirmish of the war. Anybody heard um, the colonial leader named Benjamin Church? Yeah, he was the kind of the, the swashbuckling figure that really learned a lot from this first skirmish because he was almost killed. He and his troops, were, they were coming from the, the north to find Medicom hiding in Tiverton. And they make the mistake of walking right into this field. The natives in superior numbers are behind the trees. They spring the ambush. Church and his men have to hide along the shore. He said it was a rocky shore, so I imagine they're behind these rocks. And they're going to be annihilated, but he gets lucky. A ship sees his predicament, and on the ship were a couple canoes. Captain Gould was on board the ship, and he sends the canoes over, and he ferries Church and his men to safety. And 
I always wondered why did the natives just rush them and wipe them out? And the only conclusion I can come to is it hadn't yet become an all or nothing war. Um, so they let them off the hook and they shouldn't have because Church really becomes proficient after that. He goes, boy, I'll never walk into an ambush again. I'll always have a friendly native by my side uh, who could spot an ambush a mile away. And he tells, you know, all the militia to do that and they they ignore him and so they continually walk into ambushes. Church, again, another nice day trip. Church is buried in these uh, raised, this is his family plot, these raised uh, graves uh, right on the town common of Little Compton. That's by the church there. One of the old foundations of the garrisons. So a garrison would be one house, say here in Norfolk, we pick one house that's a good size house that we want to be the safe haven if we're attacked. And in that house would be extra ammunition, extra water, extra food. And sometimes they'd even put bricks in the lower levels of the wall. So if the natives were firing muskets, it couldn't come through the wall. And um, in my opinion, the natives, one of the mistakes they made was wasting too many warriors raiding these garrison houses. Because inside it's well fortified and they could pick off the natives but every now and then they would overrun a garrison house, and this is the one in uh, Dartmouth, Mass, uh, that they overran. So, but that was rare. So I think strategically wasting warriors on a garrison house was a bad mistake. Hit and run was much better. You know, guerrilla warfare that was perfect for the natives here. They they knew the land better than the colonists. So Medicom, the red arrows show his movement. So the first couple of weeks, he's got to get off Mount Hope because remember, they attacked Swansea. He doesn't want to be trapped. Um, hides his people over here for a while, gets in that fight with uh, Benjamin Church. There's the Pease Field. But eventually decides, I can't stay here forever. I'll get surrounded. So he slips right under the nose of the English, goes across the Taunton River, and he's starting to head towards this direction. And the reason he decides to go west is he's heard through the grapevine that the Nipmucks on their own have risen up and attacked the English. And the first town that they attacked is, is the one I live in now, Menden, Massachusetts. So they burned Menden to the ground. And Medicom now knows he's got an ally. Another tribe is taking up arms against the colonists. So Montauk, that means Mount Hope, that's the Indian term for it. Uh, they probably followed the Blackstone River, that would be a likely path, and then veered off. There's a uh, King Philip lookout on the Blackstone River, if you ever want to go to it. It's in Uxbridge, and you get a beautiful view looking to the south. And this, again, this is one of the many King Philip lookouts. But I don't think he was at all these places. It's kind of like George Washington slept here. Uh, you know, I think a uh, more likely scenario is colonists probably really did see Indians at this lookout. They don't know the names of Indians. The one they know is Medicom or King Philip, same person, and they'd name it after the one, they, the one name they know. So that's why, you know, when I opened the presentation, I said as a kid, I would see Medicom this, King Philip that all over Massachusetts. And when I, over the years in my speaking, you know, I'd often look at an old paper map of the town I was going to, and sure enough, there'd be a Medicom Lane or a Wheat, Wheatamu Avenue, she was another leader, or, uh, you know, right down the list of the people involved in King Philip's War, every town seems to have a street named after them. So they arrive at the banks of the Ware River in Hardwick, Mass. These are out by Quabbin. Beautiful area, by the way. Um, it's kind of like uh, they've protected the land enough there that you still get a sense of what Massachusetts used to look like with small farms. But the Nipmucks have a huge encampment here. So this, this side of the Ware River, this would have been just covered with wigwams. And Medicom arrives and joins forces with them.
And this is when the ambush of Brookfield occurs. The way it happened was there were some militiamen stationed in the garrison house here in Brookfield, and their orders were to go out and make these natives at the Winnemesset village, the one on the Ware River I showed you, uh, meet with them and force them to sign a peace treaty. And the way you'll do that, this is their instructions from Boston, is to wear armor and go on horseback, you know, a real show of force. And the Indians should recognize your strength. So they go, they march to the meeting location, and the natives aren't there at dawn like they're supposed to be. The soldiers, the militia, and they're not English soldiers, by the way. There's no English soldiers involved. It's just colonial militia involved. They smell trouble, and they tell Captain Wheeler, let's get back to the garrison. Something's wrong. He makes the mistake of letting three people from the town of Brookfield say, no, no, we'll show you where their village is. You can have the meeting there. Big mistake. <clears throat> There's no way the natives are going to let these guys come into their village armed and on horseback and with uh, armor on. So they walk right into an ambush, and Wheeler shot right off his horse. But his son drags him and throws him over his own horse, and they get back to the garrison with some of the other survivors. And then the natives lay siege, and they burn every structure in Brookfield. But when they go to burn down the garrison, where the people are hiding out and fighting off the natives, uh, the colonists get lucky, storm clouds move in, rain comes and puts out the fires. So, you know, they tried to burn the whole thing down by taking this big wagon on fire and throwing it into the house, but uh, the rain put it out. So when <clears throat> we did the King Philip's War book, I said to Eric Schultz, why don't we put Captain Wheeler's diary at the back of the book because he's... Um, He's a, a public figure now. You don't have to have a, a copyright to use it. So we put it in, and we put his diary in, Church's diary in, and Mary Rowlandson, who was a captive, all in the back of the book. Uh, this is where Major Wilson was killed at that ambush site. And then it was interesting, in the woods, this has nothing to do with King Philip's War, but I found this... Benjamin Franklin milestone in the woods. And it's hard for you to read, but it says 67 miles from Boston, 36 to Springfield. So that's when the mile markers were along the Old Bay Path, basically going from Springfield to Boston. And then nearby, again, nice day trip, one of the trustees of the reservation's property, the Rock House Reservation. A lot of native artifacts were found underneath here because it would be a great shelter in the winter. You could you know, build a fire here and it would reflect off the wall. So we're now maybe, let's see, about three or four months into the war and uh, some of the natives have left the Brookfield area, gone up to the Great Falls on the Connecticut River and they're launching raids culminating in the burning of Springfield. And uh, this is when a terrible ambush against the settlers occurs. By the way, the Mohawks are in New York, but they do not join Medicom. He tries to get them. He needs as many tribes as he can, but they rebuff them. They, they've always been arch enemy against these New England tribes, and they want nothing to do with it. So Bloody Brook occurs when settlers are holding out in Deerfield. Most of the town has been burned. Deerfield's claim to fame is mostly from the French and Indian Wars, but that, that was later. But it was also burned during King Philip's War. And um, so reinforcements are sent up from the communities to the south. They get the few survivors. They get the bags of grain, and then they head back south. And as they're heading back south with the survivors, they let their guard down, thinking, well, we weren't attacked. We're home free. The problem was the natives had a good plan. They figured when these heavy wagons are heading south, they're going to be loaded up with survivors and whatever else they can carry. They're going to get stuck in the mud of Muddy Brook, that's now called Bloody Brook, 
and that's just what happens. The whole wagon train bunches up on the trail. The natives are hiding on either side. And they spring the ambush. Seventy-six English people are killed in this one attack, which is a big number for back then. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't afford casualties like that. And they're buried on the town green in um, South Deerfield. So if you're out that way, be sure to take your car and go up to the top of Mount Sugarloaf, and this is the view you have looking towards Sunderland. It's, that's the Connecticut River, just a gorgeous view. And, you know, you look down at these farms, not much has changed out there since King Philip's War. So I remember when I was up there, I said, oh, this will be a scene in Until I Have No Country, where Tamaset and a couple other warriors are up on the mountain surveying which farm to hit next. Because they, they pretty much wiped out that, that Pioneer Valley. And when I go into the schools, I show the kids this slide. I said, this is Mount Greylock, where part of the mountain had a rock slide. But I tell them, if you look carefully, it's the profile of a face looking this way. You know, with the mouth curved down, the eye, the nose. And I said, that's Chief Greylock. Come back to warn us. Don't develop the mountain. <laughs> And uh, the last time I did this, a little girl said, that's not the chief. I said, what is it? She said, can't you see? It's a polar bear coming up his head. There's his, his nose, his mouth, his eye. <laughs> and then I lost complete control. <laughs> so I put this slide in for next time to show the kids. I said, look at this one. Gargoyles, even an alien right in the middle. And the way this works is, this is a, a rock ledge. This is water. I flipped the slide on its side so the rock is reflecting off the water and it forms the heads in the middle. <laughs> so back to the war. The two tribes are winning and they control this big chunk of Massachusetts. We're into the winter now and the colonists decide to do something which struck me as very odd they strike a neutral tribe, the Narragansetts. I'm like, why in the world would they do that? Their thinking is the Narragansetts are the most powerful tribe. We have intelligence that they might be helping the Wampanoags. We'll never know for sure. And they think that if the Narragansetts join, we'll definitely lose because they're so powerful. But if we do a sneak attack against the Narragansetts, they won't know what hit them. So that's what they decide to do. The colonies, the three colonies unite. They find the great swamp winter encampment where most of the Narragansetts lived during the winter, and they spring the, the attack. The settlers, of course, called this a fight because they lost casualties, but the natives called it a massacre because they were neutral. And for the settlers, it was really tough. In Until I Have No Country, the, there's three characters, Tamaset, um, Quinna, who's another Native American, but then John Homer, who's from Medfield, Mass. And I've got him as one of the people who has to fight his way into the encampment. And if you were one of the first ones over the log into the Native fortified village, you were shot right off the log. But eventually, they had the numbers, they being the colonists, to overrun the encampment. And so hidden down in Charleston, Rhode Island, is a monument to that uh, Narragansett um, village and then the attacking colonies with the stones named around it. The Benjamin Church was there, and he said, you know, we have so many casualties, we shouldn't try to walk back through this snowstorm, this is December, all the way back to Wickford. We should just take over the encampment and fight the natives from their own camp. Uh, because, you know, there were food there, there were wigwams and protection. He was overruled, and Winslow torched the whole village. <laughs> And they did have to walk all the way back in the snowstorm, and many of the soldiers who were wounded died, and they're buried here in a mass grave at the Wickford Garrison. And for the Narragansetts, King Philip's War was a disaster because 
you think before the war they owned most of modern day Rhode Island. After the war, they just had this tiny little reservation down in Charleston, Rhode Island, where they have their meeting house today. So we're now, you move ahead to February, and uh, of course, the surviving Narragansetts have joined. So you've got three tribes against the English. And this is when they attack Lancaster and take Mary Rowlandson captive. Her captivity is remarkable. She was a really smart, tough woman, um, survived 11 weeks on the move, barely any food. But interestingly, in her diary, she wrote, I'm starving, but so are the natives. So the natives didn't have time to grow their crops. They were so busy fighting the prior summer. So now in the winter, they're running out of food. And um, Hertz was one of the few garrisons that the natives got inside. Uh, she was taken captive. Uh, her little daughter was taken captive. I finally found her daughter's grave. She didn't survive the captivity. It was way in the middle of the woods out in Hardwick, Mass. Uh, but Mary survived and um, even had a conversation with Medicom. So when I read that, I said, perfect. I'll just put that exact conversation in Until I Have No Country because Mary Rowlandson's a character. And this is where she was released. This is called Redemption Rock in uh, Princeton. I'm standing on the top. So this would have been a known place to both the English and the natives because it's such an unusual glacial erratic. And they traded Mary Rowlandson for money, presumably to buy muskets from the French. But um, she survives, and uh, her book becomes the first uh, best-selling book by a woman from America. Maine was attacked, but this was independent of Medicom. These were the Abenakis hitting coastal Maine, mostly out of revenge because they felt they'd been cheated in trade. Medicom's War Club, a reader sent me this sketch he made, because the actual War Club, we think, we don't know for sure, but we think is the one at the Fruitlands Museum. It's very ornate. It's in a case, so it's hard to get a good picture of it. But it's one big maple piece inlaid with triangular shells of, of wampum. And then, was it, maybe some of you local history buffs know, was Norfolk back then part of Medfield? What was it part of? Part of Rentham. Okay. So Rentham, yeah, all the. Yeah, North Rentham. Because all the towns were so much bigger back then, then over time they'd split off, usually to do with you know community groups or the church. Because, um, for example, Medfield was bigger than it was. Dedham was way bigger than it was. And um, this dramatic attack at Medfield occurred. The natives came from the Mount Wachusett base camp. And in the, yeah, the Peak House, now... And until I have no country, we, we don't know for sure if it was the farmer from the Peak House. But remember I said, in my novel, it's John Homer from Medfield. And this is a true story. A farmer goes out to the barn the morning of the attack, doesn't know the natives are coming. And it's early in the morning, and he's got the pitchfork. He's shoveling hay to the cattle. And then he sees a moccasin, you know, and he looks. And then he sees the outline of a leg. He knows there's a native hiding under the the hay, picks up the pitchfork to kill the native, and then he stops, and he's smart. He goes, what if there's more than one? <laughs> They're going to jump me. So he's really cool. He acts like he doesn't see anything, puts the pitchfork down, leaves the barn, runs to the house, wakes up his family, and they all survive. They made it to the, the garrison. So 18, I think it was, again, off the top of my head, I think about 18 people were killed in Medfield and others were taken captive, but he survived. And you get into the spring and believe it or not, the English are still walking into ambushes and they walk into one at the Sudbury fight. And this time the natives tricked them. The soldiers are coming from Marlborough. They're heading this way. They're gonna go between these two hills. A couple natives come out and run, act like they're afraid of the soldiers. The soldiers think, oh, there's just two or three. They go chasing after them. When they get between the two hills, 
they close the vice. And uh, Wadsworth and his men are, are wiped out. But spring turns out to be that the turning point of the war, this climax where it's the high water mark of the natives. It looks like they're going to drive everybody out of uh, most of Massachusetts. You know, almost to, if you think of like a ring around, like the 128 ring around Boston, it's like they're going to drive everybody into that. Because they're hitting all these towns and many more I couldn't fit on here. But uh, by April, things are not going well for the natives. This was kind of their last big raid. Uh, Cannon Chet is caught and beheaded. He was the leader of the Narragansetts who joined up with Medicom. And the English are finally taking Benjamin Church's advice and they're fighting alongside the Mohegans and Niantics, using them as guides. And then the decisive battle occurs at the Great Falls that we now call Turner's Falls. So the Great Falls was always a, an ancestral place for Native Americans to gather and catch fish because they'd come up the Connecticut River. This was really the first big waterfall where the salmon would be trying to jump and they could catch fish. So they, they always had a big, big community there. And, they thought they were safe up there until Captain <coughs> Turner in May of 1676 gets volunteers to raid that village. And he goes up the Connecticut River and um, the village is a big one and he decides we're going to attack it the same way the Indians do. Infiltrate the edges at night and then wait till dawn till we have enough vision to actually see and fire our muskets right into the wigwams while they're sleeping. And um, it catches the natives by total surprise. He had some intelligence from a, an English boy who escaped a captive, and he told Captain Turner, hey, they don't really have more than one or two guards posted. And a lot of the natives tried to get away, but it's springtime and the Connecticut River is swollen. It just sweeps them. They can't get across it sweeps them right over the falls. And another element of the surprise is, so Turner's coming up like this. He doesn't just attack like that. He curls around to the north and then traps them in the bend on the river. And um, after he wipes out the village, he's got to get back to safety. It's a long way back to Northampton and Hadley. And some of the surviving natives pick up his trail, and in Greenfield they kill Captain Turner. So even though he wins the decisive battle of the war, uh, he does not survive that, that day. But the natives, they don't have a safe place now in southern New England. This was their last one, and it's been overrun. <clears throat> we think Metacom was somewhere near Mount Hope in that, excuse me, somewhere near Mount Wachusett, but wanted to get back to his home turf. Maybe because he knows that area best, we're not sure, but certainly the war he knows is lost. Uh, he could have gone north and escaped, but for some reason he doesn't. And sure enough, this is where Benjamin Church's uh, militia with Native Americans find him. And it's a Native American who actually is the one that fires the musket and puts two musket balls into the back of Medicom. Um, so his name was uh, John Alderman, that Native American who fired the musket. And for all intents and purposes, the, the war was over with this uh, final shot. There's a, a marker hidden in the woods of where he was killed. August 12th was the, the date. The OS is old style for the calendar. And there's an unusual tree growing there, an ash tree and a birch tree coming out of the same stump. And then the last, the last raid against the natives is the few followers are led by Anawan. I'll never forget the natives when I had that meeting with them, you know, I took their pictures. Uh, they had all read Until I Have No Country, and they said, you based Tamaset after Anawan. And this is 20 years ago. I go, who's Anawan? <laughs> and they said, read up on him and you'll see. And it really was remarkable. 
so the Native American uh, leader said, it was Anawan's spirit guiding you. And I said, you never know. I did feel I was obsessed. Uh-huh. Uh, my kids will tell you, you know, just all I wanted to talk about was King Philip's War. And they're like, oh, Dad, not another battlefield. Uh, but, but maybe, but the, the similarities were remarkable. But Anawan was the last leader, and he was caught when Church came over this rock ledge, looked down, saw Anawan's campfire, sent his men around either side, and, and had him trapped. So this is a period wood carving of Anawan's surrender. The reason he surrendered, by the way, is it was a rainy night, and they had made the mistake, they being the Indians, made the mistake of putting all their muskets in one place and under a mat to keep them dry. So when the soldiers came in, they didn't have the muskets right next to them. And I'd like to close on a more positive note that, remember I said how many people learned about this, and none of us did. Uh, They teach it in the schools today. And the kids love this stuff. You talk about Native Americans. They perk up like you wouldn't believe. I'll bring in, you know, I'll make an arrowhead in front of them. That's all they want to do. They just, there's something in a kid that relates to the Native American and that way of life and the outdoor way of life. Then they get their iPads and we lose them. But, (laughs) But in the early days, that's all they want. Thank you very much. Thank you.